sent you this morning and Father that your spirit has fallen in this place Lord we are reminded that you are our healer Lord we think of this morning of the woman who who knew that if she just but touched the hem of your garment Lord that there would be healing Father today we pray that you that we would reach out in faith and touch you, Lord God Almighty. 
Father, that healing would flow in this place. Lord, that your name, the name of Jesus, would be exalted and lifted high. And that we would be reminded once again that there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That we'd be reminded again that there's no other name that is more highly exalted than the name of your son, Jesus. Lord, I'm reminded this morning of the man who came to Jesus and, and sought healing for his daughter, I believe. And Lord Jesus, he just said to you, just speak the word, don't even, don't even come, but just speak the word, God. Lord, this morning we're asking that you would speak a word, Lord, and, and touch lives. Lord, we know that there are many that are, that are physically suffering, and we ask for them now. And Lord, for the unseen spiritual battles that are going on, we know that they are. And, and Father, we pray that you would speak the word. God, you are a healer. You've asked us. You called us to ask that we might receive, to seek that we might find, to knock that the door might be opened unto us. And so this morning, Lord, we ask, believing, God, that you are the God who hears and the God who answers. We seek, Lord, believing that you are the God who reveals. Father, this morning, we, we glorify your name. We lift up the name of your son, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Children's Church. Well, we have had a wonderful Sabbath service, amen? amen. And it began at 9.30. Uh, we had a wonderful time of testimony. And if you missed it, you really missed a good one. And uh, Pastor Kurt and his family shared, and there were other couple of testimonies during that time, and uh, baptisms of God moving, of God strengthening, and, and, uh, and it continues uh, in this service, amen, God's blessing, God's blessing. Well, it is good to be here. It's a, it's a privilege to serve this body of Christ, and, and I would say that our family has been so blessed in being here, and, and uh, we love you guys. Uh, we appreciate the relationships that God has built in our lives uh, with you, and, and uh, we're just really thankful for this, for this body, and and I want to say that this morning. Well, we've had uh, a busy couple of weeks. Uh, Venice and I have signed up to do fostering care as needed. We've had a couple of boys, three and four, a year apart. And, and uh, I'm a little rusty. <laughs> and uh, I'm a little stunned. They're wonderful boys, but to, it is certainly... A, uh, a challenge and a blessing, and and uh, we're really glad to have the opportunity to to uh, bless others. You know, I saying this in class. If you've if you were raised in a, a loving home, you have a lot to be thankful for. And if you were raised in a home that with parents that cared for you and provided for you, you have a tremendous amount to be thankful for because not all do. Amen. Well, it's good to be in God's house and, and uh, just to be able to share this day with you. Lots of things going on. Birthday celebrations. Anybody born in June? One, two, three. Three people. Awesome month to be born in. God is the author of life. Amen. Life is a wonderful thing. Um, as we live it in line with God, it is wonderful, amen? As we get off of God's plan, then it becomes not so much fun when we, we paint ourselves into corners or we do things that, that hurt ourselves or others. It's, it's not as much fun. But God, God in his wisdom and his sovereignty has given us his law and he's given us his spirit that we can walk in his spirit and love, love God and love others as we would love ourselves. Or, yes, as we exactly treat others as we would want to be treated. 
You knew what I meant. Amen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Is this an important scripture? Yes. One of the most important scriptures in all of scripture. Of course, it comes in a context when God called Abraham out of Ur, of the Chaldeans. They were an idolatrous group. The ancient world marked in polytheism many gods. Many gods, and, and God showed up to Abraham, and God showed up in the life of Moses and others and, and said, there are no other gods. I alone am God. There is no other. Now, of course, there are so-called gods. There are things that people worship that they would call gods. But there's no true and living God other than the great I am. And he's one. And God, in his mercy, his sovereignty, his work, have been pulling out a people from certainly since Abraham, that know who he is, that he is the great I am. This is incredibly important scripture, that the God that we serve, the Lord that we serve, is one, is one. In the midst of this, these pagan cultures that had a God for the thunder and a God for birth and a God for the rain, and a God for the night, God interjected himself into human history and said, that's a bunch of lies. That's bogus. I alone am God. And, of course, to the church, it's important to know this. Not just to ancient Israel, but to the church, God says, I alone am God. It's an essential cardinal truth. That we serve the one great I am. Even as uh, God talked to Moses and called him to deliver his people to be the agent of that change. He said, tell Israel, tell Israel that the I am sent you. The I am. Hear, O Israel, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We're to have one God, and of course we don't. We don't struggle, in our culture at least, with, with idolatry and polytheism uh, per se, but we certainly struggle with putting things before the Lord, don't we? And uh, as if we get to it, there's a scripture that says that, you know, when we, when we sin, we're really, idol we're really committing idolatry because we're putting something before God. Look at this passage in Isaiah 43. I love this scripture you are my witnesses, says the Lord. Again, remember that God is pulling out a people that know that he alone is God, the great I am. And my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. There was a, a scribe during the earthly ministry of Christ that came to him. And he, I don't know if he was challenging him or what the situation exactly was, but he inquired uh, of the first, the greatest commandment. And, and uh, one of the things in that interchange that the scribe said is he said, there is one God and there is no other but he. And in that exchange... Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And so I think in that man's confession, there was truth. But the culture within the church and often uh, without the church, of course, but sometimes within the church is increasingly challenging and rejecting the idea of one God. Think about it, what was once the fabric of the United States of America in recognizing the one true and living God. Boy, has that changed. 
Boy, is, is that truth being rejected that there is one God, he alone, the great I am. It seems like we live in a culture that's sowing unbelief in, in this truth that there is one God. You know, you, I realize that it's just uh, entertainment, but a lot of the, the movies, you know, they, they, they build up these superheroes and they have all these powers and they seem to be ascending and, and uh, there's, there's an underlying message there that man is, is becoming greater, that man is is somehow ascending to godhood. And, of course, it's in some religions, as you, I'm sure, are well, uh, aware. It seems like the fruit of evolution, uh, the fruit of evolution, the belief that we're evolving is, 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 is not just about the past and where we're at, but it's about the future. And it seems like the lie of evolution, the fruit of it is, is, bear, is bearing fruit, and it's getting into the psyche of people that somehow we're on this path of ascension and that one day we will become gods ourselves. But man is not a god. God, Man is not God and he's not a god. Man will not and does not ascend. We're mortal. And God clearly talks about body and soul being destroyed we're created we're the creation we're not the creator monotheism one god the cardinal truth of christianity it's it's good it's it's absolutely essential but i want to say this morning that many will say there is one god as the jews and the muslims do but it's important to realize that a belief that there is one God is not what saves. We might wish that it were, but it's not the case. James writes that you believe there, are, uh, there is one God. You do well, James wrote. Even the, the demons believe and tremble. Understanding... That there's one God is essential, but that in itself will not save. But God is calling people to trust him. Amen? Trust. That's what God is asking of people. It's one thing to believe that he is. It's another thing to trust him, to trust God, to trust his word. Remember, God says believe. Jesus said For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Belief was this key, this catalyst to salvation. Whoever believes, Jesus said. But if we look at this and we consider it, we realize that belief is trust. Belief is trust. To believe in Christ is to trust him. If, if believing in Christ means anything, it means that we trust the message that Christ carries. Amen? To believe in Christ, if it means anything, it means that we trust the message and really the, not only the message that he carries, but he is the message. To believe in Christ and to trust in his message, I think they're, they're, they're inseparable. They're inseparable. If we don't believe the message that Christ carries, the message that he is, we are not trusting him. It's hard to say I trust Christ while simultaneously saying I don't believe what he's saying. I think that makes sense, hopefully. But it's important to trust the message, the messenger, because in Christ is revealed the truth about the one God whom we serve. This is an interesting thing about trust, that God is building a kingdom of trust, if I can say it that way. If you just think about it, that in eternity, God will still be God, will will still be his creation in unity and harmony with him, but God will still be God and there will be required trust in God of his faithfulness, of his goodness, 
And I think in some ways this, this is, is just, just kind of, of a trial run of, for eternity. Can you trust him now? If you trust him now, you'll trust him then. God is infinite. We will not be infinite and we will need to trust him. Which means in eternity we will need to trust. The scriptures reveal one true and living God. And yet, there is mystery in the Godhead. If you've ever talked much about the Godhead, you realize that that it's something that can be struggled with and often is. It's a humbling topic. It's a mystery because the Scripture tells us that no one has seen God at any time. That what is being said is that God's essential nature is unseen. And I go back to this word transcendent, that all that we see in in this time-space continuum, the universe, is created by God. Everything in it is a creation or a manifestation. And yet God existed before it came into being, right? And so God is transcendent. And so I I think of it this way, that that God's, uh, it's a mystery because God's essential nature is unseen, and so it is fully understandably incomprehensible. It is understandable that God is incomprehensible to us. If we knew everything, if we could figure out everything about God, I don't think he'd be God. There is mystery. For the Christian reads their Bible, and we see that God is declared to be one in nature, one in essence, and one in being, but he has revealed himself in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. One tract that the church puts out uh, says it this way. Speaks of the unity within the Godhead in this manner. When we speak of God in heaven, transcendent and holy other, we think of the Father. When we speak of God on earth, imminent and known in human terms, we think of the Son. When we speak of God omnipresent, at work in the world and in our hearts, we think of the Holy Spirit. That was a great quote. Um, I can get you that tract if you would like that. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is Emmanuel. Look at the scripture, Matthew 123. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, which the virgin's birth speaks of the nature and origin of Christ. The virgin shall be with child, bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. I like to think of it this way, that Jesus is the one God with flesh on. And the disciples concurred because they worshipped him. And you only worship the one true and living God. Isaiah writes of the Messiah as he prophesies, as he's moved by the Holy Spirit. He says that the Messiah will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. John 1.14, you know it well, Jesus is the Word become flesh. Paul writes to the Colossians that in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amazing to think of and understand the work of God. Of course, the preeminent title of Christ in my mind is the Son of God. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The only begotten, and Jesus said he proceeded forth from the Father. 
begotten, not created, right? There's a difference. I could make a robot that looks like myself and acts like me. Nobody would appreciate that. It might be, be able to be done in the future. But to create something is different than to beget something. And the Son is described as the only begotten of the Father who proceeded forth from God. Light of light, if you will. Light proceeding forth from the glory of God. I like to think of the Son as the invisible God visible. The Bible tells us of the Holy Spirit that also, interestingly enough, that the Holy Spirit proceeds forth from the Father. Same word as Jesus described his proceeding forth from the Father, just as the Son. The Bible tells us that the Spirit of the Father and the Son is the means through whom God dwells within us. Interesting. There's that oneness again, the Spirit of the Father and the Son dwelling in us. God dwelling within us through the Spirit of the Father and the Son. Interesting. Not just an impersonal force. I think this is important to emphasize. The Holy Spirit is not just an impersonal force within me, but personal. God himself. If you look at the, the scriptures concerning the Holy Spirit, it defines the Holy Spirit as a person, and I believe that person is God. Think of this, that in John, the Bible speaks of the Holy Spirit as convicting. The Holy Spirit can be grieved, is written several times. The Holy Spirit speaks and testifies. The Holy Spirit can be lied to. The Holy Spirit leads in ministry both positively and negatively. Remember, in negative terms, Paul thought he wanted to go somewhere, and the, Holy Spirit, the Bible says it twice. The Holy Spirit forbade him to go. And remember that uh, Philip, the evangelist, the Holy Spirit said to him, Go to the chariot. Go to that chariot. I'm directing you there. The Holy Spirit, the very presence of God. Think about the difference between just understanding the Spirit as a power force and, a per and the person of God dwelling within me. It's about relationship, right? My, what's going on with me and God is about relationship. He's my father, the spirit of his son within me, the Holy Spirit crying out, Abba, Father. There's personal, there's, there's an intimacy there. It's not just plugging into the power uh, socket. There's power, but there's personal relationship, there's intimacy. And I think when we get stuck on the Holy Spirit as just a power, we miss that personal aspect, that intimacy that God wants within us every day. And so when I sin, I'm grieving the Holy Spirit, God. Not just the force, not just the power, but God, I'm hurting God. The Holy Spirit, the omnipresent God, personally present and resident within the believer. Scriptures paint a mysterious picture. I'll be the first to admit it. Of one true and living God, the great I am, yet revealed and manifested in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I want you to think about that. If This is a crazy thought, but maybe I shouldn't ask it this way. Um, the transcendent God, who is outside in a sense of his creation because he existed before it, if he wanted to personally dwell with his people, how would he do it? He would come down among us. And he has done that in the person of a son. And he dwells within us through his Holy Spirit. Let me challenge you today. And I know that we don't all understand everything the same way. Let me challenge you today that in your study to know and understand God, it must lead you back to this key truth that God is one. God is one. In your pursuit to know God and understand him, understand, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There's only one, there's only one great I am. 
God revealed, manifested Christ in me, the hope of glory. I want you to consider this verse. It'll be in front of you, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, that's a, that's a peculiar uh, grammatical sentence that the Word is both described as being with God and yet was God. That kind of, uh, that's kind of confusing. It's peculiar. Uh, what, what is being painted again, this mysterious picture of distinction and yet unity. We're called to trust. We're called to trust what God is saying about himself. Why is this important? Why is it important that when someone says, what God do you serve, you say you serve the one God. You don't serve three gods, you serve one God. Why is that important? Well, number one, it's important to know whom we serve. And number two, it is because this is the testimony that God has given of himself. It is the truth contained in the scriptures. And... We are commanded to believe what God is saying, right? Amen? God is saying, believe me. There's a, there's a passage, 2 Chronicles 20, 20. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. Faith is the thing that God is looking for in people. Remember, it was the 12 spies sent out, and 10 spies came, down, came back with an evil report. The two spies believed God. God is looking for faith. God is looking for trust. God is looking that even though we may not understand how the walls of Jericho are going to come down, maybe we don't understand how we're going to defeat the giants of the land, we're trusting him. And even though sometimes when we talk about the Godhead, there's mystery in it, and it doesn't always make sense to our thinking, God is asking us to trust him that he is one God, the living, the great I am, revealed in his Son, and through his Holy Spirit. In fact, the Bible, John, the beloved disciple, was very strong in some of the things he said about not believing God. He who does not believe God, John writes, has made him a liar. And I thought about that, and I thought, you know, when you go back to Eve, the problem there in the beginning uh, you know, Eve, Eve called God a liar. You realize that? That's, that's harsh, but that's what she did. Because she believed the lie that the devil told her that she wouldn't die. And God had said, you will die. And so she believed a lie. And so in believing that lie, essentially what she was saying, God, you're not telling the truth. And in her act, not just an act of partaking of forbidden fruit, but an act of defiance and an act of questioning and an act of condemning God. God is always looking for faith. Believe what I'm saying. Trust in me. I am the one and true and living God, the great I am. We would do well to hear Christ. As Hebrew says, in times past, God spoke to the fathers through the prophets. He has in these last days spoken to us through his son. We would do well to pay attention to what the son has revealed. As he spoke and said, before Abraham was, I am. As John the Baptist testified to him and said, he was before me, even though we know he was not physically. When Jesus said, I proceeded forth from the father, that I am the only begotten. When Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When John writes that these things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of Christ. Why is it important? Well, we need to believe what God is revealing, what God is saying. And it's about worship. It's about worship of the one true and living God. I love that first song that we sang. I don't know the name of it, the first song of the second set. Worship of the one true God is a big deal, isn't it? 
The Father is seeking those to worship him in spirit and in truth. Remember that it was Satan who tempted Jesus to kneel and worship before him. And Jesus declared, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. It's about worship, church. The worship of the I am. Worship of the God who is one and yet revealed by the Son and through the Holy Spirit. We even baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. One God, not just theology, but practical living. Again, it's a matter of worship. It won't be in front of you, but listen to the scripture. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Did you catch that? Idolatry, these sins. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. To understand that, that there's only one true and living God is not just a theological position, but it is also a lifestyle. It is also to be borne out and shown and declared in the way we live. That I live my life knowing that there's one God. I'm not God. My spouse isn't God. My boss isn't God. There's only one God, and I live in reflection of that truth. It's not just a position, theological position, but it is a lifestyle. I serve the one and only true and living God, the great I am. So today I want to challenge you, are you trusting the I am? Are you trusting the great I am? I like this verse in Psalms. It, it, it says, for all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Let me encourage you today to hold on to this scripture, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hang on to that. Hang on that you serve the one true and living God. Not three, but one God revealed by the Son and through his Holy Spirit. Would you stand with us and worship team, would you come? When the stars burn down and the
Father, our great calling and, and our great command is to love you, the Lord our God, who is one with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. Father, how inadequate we are to the calling. But Lord, as you live in us through your spirit, as you reconcile us through your son and bring us into harmony and relationship and forgiveness, as you fill us with your presence, Lord, it is possible. It is possible to love you, the one and true and living God, our only Savior, with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. Father, truly, you are our Savior. You have done everything that is needed for the purchase of our redemption. Father, 4,000 years ago, there you called out a man Abraham and you said come out of this pagan culture come out of this culture that teaches that there are many gods and learn from me that I am the true and living God Father we worship you today we thank you that you have revealed yourself in your son and through your spirit we love you God Jesus' name. Amen.